um, I would like to invite uh, Professor George Aller uh, to, to give his uh, keynote lecture. Professor Aller uh, from, uh, from uh, ETH is well known to all, uh, to all people, to all people involved with, with nonlinear dynamics. And so I, I don't think there is a need or also time to, to say many words about him. So please, George, uh, give, give your talk. And, and uh, please for, uh, forgive me for this short presentation, no. but I prefer- Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for the short, short introduction. introduction I... But it's better to give more space to you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would, I'm George Haller. I would like to also thank for the opportunity. Thank you uh, to, uh, thanks to Professor Walter LaCarbona for the opportunity to speak here. And in general, I think in the name of all the attendees, I'd like to express our gratitude for the great organization. This event has been organized fantastically so far. Everything on time, the information flow was perfect. And we all realized the challenges you and your team had to face. So we truly appreciate your service. This is a great service to the community. So thank you for that as well. So my title is Fast Reduction of Nonlinear Finite Element Models to Spectral Submanifolds. A long title, I'll uh, spend some time on the details. I want to point out that this, a lot of this is joint work with my two extremely talented and hardworking postdocs, uh, Shobi Jane and Mingwu Liu, who's, I apologize, I see I misspelled his last name already. So L-I is the last name, Ming Wu Li. I'm sorry about that. So I'll, I'll get back to his con contributions later. It's just a quick uh, sort of motivational slide that uh, obviously these days uh, uh, complicated, complex, what lightweight structures are, are the keyword. Uh, everybody's trying to design such things. And whenever you go for a more energy efficient and more functional and more uh, generally speaking, lighter design, then you start inevitably facing nonlinearities. At the plane, there was a movie running, a short movie running here that just stopped showing this plane that, that who's, which was clearly not intended to fly this way. Um, and to understand better the vibrations that might be created by forcing, uh, one would then go typically for a, uh, if this, yeah, for a finite element model like that, right? And this is what my talk is all about. These models are incredibly high dimensional discretizations of the original problems. So they essentially lead, generally speaking, to ODEs of this form. They're classic mechanical system ODE, generally with nonlinearities as well, and also with forcing. But the trick here is that X is a very large dimensional variable, as I show here. And potentially, you have multi-frequency forcing as well. So this might look like a standard MCK system, and we, which we all know well and teach well. But when n is really large dimensional and you have nonlinearities and forcing, this has remained a challenge really to solve efficiently. So once again, this is the key part here that I want to deal with uh, because when you then try to go ahead and calculate forced response in the system. So what you see here is the classic diagram is how the system, a particular node in the system reacts to forcing. The horizontal axis is the forcing uh, frequency and the vertical axis is the amplitude of the forcing. Then we recover this classic uh, forcing uh, frequency response function. Uh, for linear systems, these are nice spikes without any hangovers, without any foldovers. Uh, so this is a very mildly nonlinear system, but as we all know, and what this conference is all about, is nonlinearities. So calculate this would be the amplitude as a function, the response amplitude as a function of the forcing, and this is the phase as a function of the forcing, right? So this is something we know well. Now, uh, if you do this, however, in practice, I just want to show you an ex example where you do have nonlinearities as well. Um, so this is a Timoshenko beam, just 21 degrees of freedom. We're not in the finite uh, element domain, right? Far uh, from that. It's a 42 dimensional phase space in which you want to do your simulation. And uh, if you run a force response calculation, you try to find the, just the, the response of the system on the periodic forcing and you just use simple direct time integration for your system and say, use your MATLAB code, the numerical time integration takes 21 hours. And you might ask why? 
because it's it's a strongly, you know, the reasonably nonlinear system, very large dimensional phase space, and the damping is small, right? So it takes quite a while for the system to find a steady state, right? So okay, there's no problem. There are codes that are specifically developed for this, right? One of them is harmonic balance. And I think we, we took in this paper, which we did in 2020, we took the best uh, available code that we know of, the NLV uh, code out of Stuttgart, and started trying to reconstruct just part of this force response curve. Again, what you see here is this is the forcing frequency, this is the forcing amplitudes, and the black bars were just the force response calculations obtained as a direct response to numerical simulation. This way only get the stable response on the unstable ones. So then we used HL, this, this NLV, and it took us three days, I'm not exaggerating here, just to get, get this part of the curve. And we're only in 21 degrees of freedom. Again, complicated nonlinear system. We don't know exactly what it is, light damping, and this is just for 10 harmonics, right? Then we took another approach and then you can use the state of the art continuation code that was already mentioned, COCO, which we use a lot, but, it, but it's, again, you're starting hitting the dimensional bounds of, of these products already at, at 42 dimensional phase spaces, 21 degrees of freedom, because this COCO calculation took four days, right? Just to get here. And COCO is fantastic. It can do a lot of things. It can do any system that you want, not just the type, deep side subsistence. But I just want to emphasize that these problems are challenging, even with today's computational power. So this is why there's a lot of talk about model reduction, because we need lower dimensional models. Even this is too high to get even the force response. And this is the point where I wanted actually to start a calculation, if you allow me, uh, which I, to which I will come back later. But I just remember I started it now. This is a, a plate uh, or shell problem. Uh, and I'll get to the details of how exactly that calculation is running. But remember, I started it now. But the calculation is all about, it's about this uh, force response uh, calculation on an iMac Pro in my office, it's a desktop. It's a 2D shallow curved shell. It's a two dimensional problem, 11,000 degrees of freedom, which sounds like a lot of degrees of freedom compared to 21 but it's still nowhere near the finite element uh, type challenges. Nevertheless, I wanna show you in the end that this is now very, easable, easy, very easy to handle with the technology that, I, that I'd like to describe. So model reduction. So what, how does model reduction work in general? We, we, there's a need for model reduction clearly, and uh, it, it's concerned with this differential equation in general in the context of forced vibrations. And just to sort of uh, uh, discuss the subject, I neglect the nonlinearities for a second and the forcing. And again, we are in an n-dimensional phase space. The best to imagine what goes on with most uh, model reduction approaches is to visualize that they are projections. And projections in the extended phase space of positions and velocities, basically most of the techniques that are out there and competing with each other envision projecting into modal subspaces. So say E1, so if you had say a pad, the lower, your lowest mode was a complex mode with oscillations, then in this R2N, the extended phase space of positions and velocities, this would be a two dimensional subspace, right? You take the next mode, which is decaying faster, say yet E2 is yet another two dimensional subspace. The two together form a four dimensional subspace. And you can add and add more and more subspaces that after you know, aligning the coordinates axis with the eigenvectors, they are even orthogonal to each other. And the philosophy is in a linear system first that you take the full solution of the linear system shown in red, and you can understand that solution just by projecting it down to lower dimensional subspaces. If you want a four dimensional reduced order model for a linear system, go ahead and project it down to the two fastest decaying modes. You wanna to need to, if you just ultimately want a one, uh, two dimensional one, project it down, use the green one to the slowest decaying modes. And this works beautifully for a linear system because of the principle of superposition. However, people also apply this to nonlinear systems and all the system, well, not all, but most of the model reduction procedures you see do just that, POD, Galerkin, and so on. They take a nonlinear trajectory, project it down to individual linear subspaces and imagine and believe and hope that somehow from those projections, one can uh, reconstruct the full nonlinear dynamics, even though these are no longer invariant. So that's the, the, the classic challenge. And that's why there, we have all these different methods that compete with each other and try to compare uh, their errors on particular problems. And they work on one problem, not another. So what would be then perhaps a more general approach? I, I add now the nonlinearity and the forcing back. But this is really a fundamental idea that, that I learned about I, not that long ago, but about maybe 10 years ago, but it was con conceived in longer dynamics uh, literature right at the time when I was done with my PhD and unbeknownst to me at the time, 
uh, Steve Shaw and Christophe Pierre wrote this really amazing uh, seminal paper about their idea that, you know what, maybe these linear structures here have nonlinear continuations, right? So then they started looking for them in terms of series expansions. Uh, the math in the mathematics literature, only about 10 years later, completely independently, you know, Rafa Delaliave and others didn't know about this work by Steve and Christophe, but they started looking at continuations of, of eigenspaces in the same fashion. So later came the mathematics. The idea here is that you take the same eigenmodes that you would normally have and try to look for uh, nonlinear continuations of that. So this one dimensional slowest eigenspace would have a nonlinear continuation here. I, I uh, denoted by WE1. And I call this the spectral submanifold associated with E1, E1 being the spectral subspace that we started with. And then I can also take this direct sum of E1 and E2, which remember was the slowest mode and the next mode, and try to look for a conti nonlinear continuation of that in, as a surface. And that would be the spectral submanifold W of E1 direct sum E2. And I can do this perhaps for each and every mode. Once I've added the forcing, I would also note that the theory is generally, uh, is generally enough uh, that people have put forward to deal with that. And instead of just having an equilibrium there in the middle, all of a sudden you have an invariant torus there in the middle. The dimension of that torus is equal to the number of frequencies that you are using uh, to force the system. So if you're forcing single frequency forcing, this is just a periodic orb. If you have L frequencies, then it's an invariant torus of L dimensions. So the terminology would be this would be the, the, the spectral submanifold associated with EK, which we call it, you, you don't see that term, you see N and M before, and that's uh, still being used a lot. Why do we rename something which has already a, such a well-deserved name and everybody still uses it? Because unfortunately the way it was imagined originally, it doesn't exist. Uh, or maybe everything is an N and M. Indeed, near this equilibrium point of torus, when you try to com compute these surfaces, it turns out there's infinitely many. In fact, the whole phase space is full of them. So to say that you're on a two-dimensional surface that's tangent to the eigenspace, you're not saying anything. Everything is on two-dimensional surfaces tangent to the eigenspace, eigenspace like you would have near, near a node. So there had to be some, some more thought given to this is that what exactly are we computing? Because what we're computing is true for all trajectories, right? So it turns out if you look into details of that and, and you do some more work on the mathematical front, it turns out yet, yes, there are many of these surfaces, but there's a unique one which is smoother than everybody else. In fact, it's analytic. So when you're actually doing a Taylor expansion for high enough, we one can specifically find the order for that that's in the paper that I refer to here, then you actually place yourself on that unique one. And that's the one, that's the spectral manifold. And that's how we differ from NNM. This is the unique, if you will, NNM, that's the smoothness because there's many of them. You also have several conditions that need to be satisfied, non-resonance and smoothness. Anyway, so the theory is in good shape with that I would say, and here comes the idea, model reduction is no, no longer experimenting with projections and hoping that even though those are not invariant, they give you the right result. It's restriction to these invariant manifolds, which works in any dimension. So your phase space might be you know, 100,000 dimensional, but these manifolds under the appropriate conditions are there and they're unique and let's find them and re reduce to them. If you do this calculation, just to the simplest example that, that Pierre and Shaw had, uh, this is an, uh, two nonlinear oscillators. This is from their paper. We, I think, modified it slightly in these publications just to show them. This is what actually happens there, see? So this is the, the computation of, or after cleaning up the details and the yes, uniqueness, you have a flying carpet there because this is a fourth problem. And that flying carpet is the SSM, the spectral submanifold, the slowest, attached to this periodic orbit that you see here. Okay, that's the primary force response. And any bifurcation, anything else takes place on this flying carpet, on this periodically moving carpet. So it's worth investing, computing this and reducing to the, uh, the, your mechanical system into this. In fact, the reduced order model can be computed in appropriate coordinates explicitly and by hand, uh, SSM tool was the first uh, code FSM tool one computing this, but by hand, in fact, for this problem, you can make analytic uh, predictions for things that were, were not accessible before. Isola merger, right? You can predict that analytically and not without any numerical simulation. These are, this is an I analytically pred predicted bifurc value for the existence and for the bifurcation of an isola that continuation codes would have a hard time finding. So it's an amazing tool to use these spectral submanifolds. So why isn't everybody using them? Uh, 
Well, how do you compute them? That's the question. Well, here's a, a spectral subspace over which you're looking for a, to find a tangent invariant manifold for this problem. So the first thing you do, you turn it into a first order problem. That's what everybody has been doing. Uh, Steve Shaw, Christophe Pierre, and also in the math literature, Rafael de la Davi and others. So you introduce a, a two n dimensional phase space of positions and velocities. And then in these nice coordinates, you look for a graph over this invariant subspace after you have aligned your coordinates with the subspace. So basically, once you have transferred your first two coordinates to align with the spectral subspace, you also diagonalize the linear part. So after a linear transformation, you have a new two n dimensional system of differential equations, but this is diagonal and this is the nonlinearity and it's also time dependent. So the diagonal matrix. And these are good coordinates. This is how we also teach center manifold uh, calculations. Why not go with them? There's a slight problem. In fact, there's a big problem. To achieve this form, to achieve this diagonal linear part, you need all the eigenmodes of the problem. And we're talking about a, a finite element setting. We are talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of modes, which are unrealistic com to compute or even store. And even more alarmingly, by doing this transformation, you destroy the sparsity of the nonlinearity that you naturally had to begin with, because only the nearest neighbors were interacting with each other in finite elements. So you're creating havoc just by getting co good coordinates, you're creating a bad setup for the calculation. Just for you to appreciate these problems on a finite element mesh that Shobit calculated this on um, uh, for, for a phone common type uh, uh, shell. If this is the number of degrees of freedom and, and this is the, eigen, the, the storage required for computing all eigenvectors, it goes up exponentially in this logarithmic. He couldn't even compute them you know, for these values, 10 to the five. This is still below or at finite element grade. So if you just calculate the first few eigenvectors, you're still order one in terms of storage. That's manageable. But to compute all eigenvectors, it's unfeasible. It cannot be done uh, with today's computing facility. Uh, uh, capacity. Uh, the time is even more alarming. The number of degrees of freedom, freedom only up to 10 to the 5. Uh, the computation time, just to compute the eigenvectors, you're not doing any nonlinear analysis, would be at this level 10 to the 5 a year. And this is on a fast core, uh, fast cores on, on, on the cluster. So this is unrealistic. So the, the, the burden that the diagonalization imposes on us is it cannot be handled. The other thing is the destruction of sparsity. In original physical coordinates, the nonlinearity, which is sort of the tensor that, that uh, uh, stores all the coefficients of nonlinearity, is nice and sparse. But with that modal transformation that puts you in diagonal force, you make it full. And as a result of that, the, with the phase space dimensionality again, say going up to a million, the storage space that you would need for this transform nonlinearity, say at order two already, quadratic, but at cubic, is 10 to the 10. This is gigabytes, right? And 10 to the 20 if you wanted to, to order five. Uh, at the same time, if you left it in original coordinates and you didn't transform them, then you would have very manageable times. And you know, so that, that, therefore, this problem, even though it's beautiful, the setting, it was unmanageable. It has been unmanageable. We've been writing papers about it, pushing the the boundaries of this right further and further. But at some point, we bumped into these unavoidable obstacles. So then we were scratching our heads, what to do. So there came the idea: is that uh, well. Can we just avoid this transformation at all? Even though all invariant manifold calculations start with that. Can we do it without that, right? So it's the same problem. And we, again, introduce these coordinates in, and we are now in the extended phase space of positions and velocities, right? But, and, and you will have a coefficient matrix that, which is the mass matrix here. And uh, this is the, the, the Z, X, X dot. And also I'm introducing phases for the forcing frequencies here. So phi dot is omega. We have L forcing frequencies. It can fairly general forcing with L harmonics, right? L can be anything. So this can model pretty complicated forcing. Uh, but we're not going to uh, invert B, B either. And we're not going to diagonalize A. But rather, we're going to be looking for an invariant manifold using the parametrization method that was developed in a more abstract setting for on our mappings on Banach spaces by De La Yave and co-workers, right? And uh, say the following, whatever the invariant manifold is, instead of changing coordinates, we look for it as a, as a, as a function, as an embedding from some parameter space, uh, P and also dependence on phi. So there's an abstract space, parameter space, that intrinsically parameterizes these manifolds rather than trying to construct it as a graph over the eigenspace, okay? 
So there's no diagonalization needed. And also we look, look to construct the dynamics in that parametrization space and the, the, the right-hand side of the dynamics is unknown at this point. And we will try to pick it as simple as possible, basically a normal form approach. Uh, and when you then take these two um, functional forms, first you need to know that the SSM exists, but we know under certain conditions, and you basically differentiate this for the first relationship in time, then you start getting a differential equation for these quantities. And then using the invariance of this manifold, as usual, this leads to a PD or called the cohomological equation, uh, which then we want to solve for these equations. But mind you, we never changed coordinates. This will be now harder to solve because there was a reason why we were all changing coordinates for the proofs and the constructions. None of these matrices are diagonal, resonances are not easy to diagnose and so on. So it comes with a lot of challenges, but, and, I, and Shobit is going to, to go into that in, 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 a, in another talk. But principally, again, you look for in, uh, the solutions in terms of a combined Taylor Fourier expansion, or you also need the Fourier expansion because you have forcing frequencies. You plug these in and you get a bunch of equations which you need to solve. They're linear equations as, you, as if you were doing serial Taylor, Taylor approximation. So in the end, when you work this through, and it's a lot of work, then you can solve for this now for any nonlinearity and any forcing. It's a recursive algorithm. And this only involves, when you work it out, the master mode. So if you want to construct a two or four dimensional SSM, you only need to then use the two or four eigenvectors corresponding to that rather than the 500,000 major simplification and that major reduction in computational time. And we can now do a spectral submanifold calculations of any order in any dimension. Of course, it's going to take more and more time, but, but it is doable. It's just really just taking more and more time. You've seen the, uh, the memory and computational time graphs, and we can detect resonances automatically. This actually results in several orders of magnitude reduction. And then all these problems that were not manageable uh, to this approach before become within reach. So there's now a, uh, there's a, a code that we just released a few days ago. It's SSM tool 2.0. It computes SSMs using spectral submanifolds using this approach. This is open source. It's MATLAB-based live script. That's what I started running at the beginning of this talk. I'll get to that, to that in a second. And what it has, actually, it has a generic uh, finite element code integrated in it. So the finite element code provides these nonlinear coefficients uh, for the actual SSM computational tool. It then computes SSMs of arbitrary dimension and order and, and for arbitrary forcing as well. And uh, it, it handles resonances. So whenever you have resonant modes, then automatically it will not be a two-dimensional SSM, but it will be a four-dimensional, six-dimensional, because you want to include the resonance modes. That's also built into the code. And we have, I already mentioned COCO. COCO is incredibly helpful and useful. So once you do have a rigorous model reduction, we can use COCO to explore that four or six or eight dimensional system and find say two dimensional tori or three dimensional tori in, in a half million dimensional phase space, which was, in, you know, it was unattainable before, but with this intermediate step of getting to the SSM, COCO can be deployed. And uh, Mingwu is an expert on COCO. He participated in development so that he integrated into this package. So there's several papers coming out of this. And I just show you a screenshot of, of how this code works. So I, anybody can take this and modify the, the script uh, to include their example. In fact, I, uh, I want to check if the, I'm done with the computation, uh, which is uh, as in, in good tradition, it gives me an error message, right? So <laughs> it, it ran, I ran it right before, before I, I started this. Uh, uh, it, it ran. So anyway, it takes about, uh, I don't know why it stopped, but it, it, Wait, we it believe started you again. Don't. But, but anyway, I just go back to the talk. Um, it, they, the point being is that it solves this in like real time about 10 minutes. I just got this version. It ran before the talk. Anyway, um, so I've been there. Uh, this is the type of, for instance, one example, but let's, get, let's go to a particular example because I need to get this uh, finished. Uh, this is a wing problem, right? So it's an airfoil uh, problem that Shobit worked out. The number of elements in this finite element method is, is, is practically 50,000. The corresponding degrees of freedom are 135,000, okay? I presented you with the difficulties for 21 degrees of freedom or whatever at the beginning, right? Already, it was incredible computational cost to get the exact uh, force response. This is now uh, dimension, dimension is 270,000 dimensional phase space, okay? So instead of experimenting with projections, 
This code computes these invariant manifolds exactly, reduces the dy dynamics to them. And if there's no resonance, that invariant manifold is two dimensional. On that one, without any simulation, you can find the force response as, as an appropriate fixed point because you can factor out the rotational degree of freedom in all these problems uh, and use polar coordinates in normal forms. So the computa the, the mesh assembly was an hour and 21 minutes, which can be improved because we are not you know, professional finite element uh, developers, but although sh sh this is Shobit's code and he's done a great job, but this can be further optimized. But the actual SSM calculation at order three, 11, and that's what I wanted to show you uh, on a simple problem, 11 minutes uh, at order five, 35 minutes, and order seven, 44 minutes for this number of degrees of freedom. So you get this you know, within minutes, and it does show you that this is a simulation free ca calculation of the force response because once you have the SSM, you just find the joint zero set of two functions and that's your force response. And, and it shows that the third order reduction wasn't quite great. So you have to go up to order five. And then when you go up to order seven, then there's no uh, fundamental change. So this actually, unlike previous perturbation methods that give you one answer, a one shot answer, and that's what you have to live with. Here you can set the order of the expansion for the SSM up to any point and decide whether you have converged or not, okay? Uh, this is another example by, by Ming Wu Li. He looked at uh, this um, uh, plate uh, example, uh, square plate, and this is a one one resonance because of the geometry, okay? And then when you run this, it ran up to uh, 200, he did this for 240, thousand degrees of freedom that's a half a million dimensional phase space that still took less than a day to run again we're talking about half a million degrees of uh, uh, dimensions and then you get as an output the force response curve again near the first frequency the dotted one is the linear the red one is the order three calculation order five doesn't differ much so basically that's that's justification that you actually in this particular problem you could have stopped there coco is integrated so at these points of loss of stability in the force response, COCO can take care of finding, say, Hopf bifurcations in that case. So this is a magnified image of those Hopf bifurcations. And what you have is a torus branch bifurcating out of the main force response, okay? Some of it is stable, one of it, some of it is unstable. So what you hear here, see here, just to appreciate, this is a two-dimensional invariant torus in a 4,082 dimensional phase space. So he did it for this second one, but only because he wanted to verify it numerically. The thing to understand is, is that the computational effort, once you have the SSM, is the same in 2,000 uh, degrees of freedom and 240,000 degrees of freedom because you have reduced to an invariant manifold of the same dimension. It makes then no difference, right? It takes longer to compute the invariant manifold, but you can find the torus just the same. But this is already pre inset you know, almost 5,000 dimensional phase space and invariant two torus. So I was very impressed with that, and we really needed the expertise that Ming Wu has with Coco. Um, a summary. So uh, I just wanted to say that SSM theory is a, a reduction of the force nonlinear system, of, in fact, any force nonlinear system, to a unique low dimensional invariant manifold. Okay. And the, the, with these new advances, this has sort of stepped out of just the for, of its academic beauty and has become directly applicable to very high dimensional systems of finite element grade. And so it can meet that challenge, right? And Shobit will talk more about the details of that in this reduced order model uh, session on Thursday, which I think I'm chairing, so at, at 5.15, okay? So SSM to this, this code that does that, this is a free open source code, and it can handle nonlinear of any order and type, general linear nonlinear damping, multidimensional SSM resonances. Many of our colleagues here kept asking me for years about, so okay, but what about resonances? So I'm pleased to say that we can have internal resonances and bifurcations now handled. Um, this is a three-dimensional torus in one of these calculations that's living in a very high dimensional phase space. And we can get that now for you know, finite element problems. So I was incredibly pleased to see that. I have to say, just a few days ago, we found a very nice preprint on archive.org, which, which, which does the same thing, about the same thing from a normal form perspective, but in the end actually also calculates the, the spectral submanifold. It does have limitations compared to what we are doing because it can only do cubic approximation. It can only handle geometric nonlinearities, Israeli damping. It has an autonomous approximations. However, at the same time, the authors took a lot of time to calculate the, at least the third, third order formulas by hand, which, which I think is very, very helpful. And it's also 
they showed that one can do this in a non-intrusive way. The third order coefficients also we can get in a non-intrusive way. Problem comes when you have five and seventh and higher order, then you have to have this recursive algorithm. I think there will be talks also related to this in, in the workshop, potentially in the same session. I wanted to, wanted to I don't see from the titles, but, but presumably. There's an ongoing extension of these two data-driven problems. So when, what, what, what if you don't have the equations, you can still try and construct these invariant manifolds in the phase space and come and, and become uh, and, and, and obtain uh, lower dimensional reduced order models. And um, a PhD student from my group, Mattia, will talk about that in another session on Wednesday uh, on the reduced order model one session. And that would be my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. No. Um, can, hello, George, can you, um, thank you very much for your extremely interesting talk. The, 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 um, the problem of a reliable dimension reduction for dealing with high dimensional mechanical systems in nonlinear dynamics terms is extremely important, is the future, maybe uh, one of the future uh, uh, issues of nonlinear dynamics in view of applications to high dimensional systems. And uh, it seems that you are doing an, ex an excellent, you and your group are doing an, ex an excellent work in terms of uh, mathematical basis and computational efficiency for calculate, for, for having, for describing everything on this uh, uh, invariant manifold. So there, there are questions, is... Giuseppe, in the QA. So there is a question by RT. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering, can the method handle the non-smooth non-linearities as well? You, so, you can read the Q&A, please. That's a good, may I answer that? Right. Yes, please. So right, right at the point where these manifolds are constructed at the expansion, ex expansions, right at the point of expansion, you cannot have any non-smoothness. Otherwise, you cannot differentiate the manifold, right? But away from it, yes, no question. I mean, what it will produce is it will produce, uh, you know, higher order expansions that try to approximate any potential jump in the manifold. But what it's what it's absolutely crucial is that you should have smoothness right, say, near that equilibrium point. If you hit something later, then that that's not such a, a major challenge. Uh, we can also just approximate that constraint with a very steep function. I have to admit we haven't worked that out, but I see no conceptual problem there, only non-smoothness at the equilibrium point. Okay, we have, uh, Giuseppe, can you read or shall I read? The no, no, no. Or shall I read to, to oh, make it? You, to you can also, uh, if you see it, we have a lot yeah. of questions by yeah, okay. Americo. So There's a second, second question by uh, Americo Kunha. Uh, Sorry if I mispronounced the name. Um, Thank you. So two questions. Could you comment about the similarities and differences between the reduced order models obtained with sub-manifolds and those computed with machine learning tools by cringing, polynomial chaos, neural networks? What are the advantages of your, of your approach? Machine learning tools, which are also using, are guessing about the existence of these, right? The, they don't know. We have an exact theory that tells you that they exist. They also give you cases in which they don't exist, so don't bother, right? So you can still run a machine learning algorithm that will probably produce you some, for you something approximate even when it doesn't exist. So the value here is that we're reaching speeds that we don't have to rely on machine learning. We get the exact thing, right? And for those of you who have worked with machine learning, I don't have to tell you that that's a major advantage, but then you don't have to change methods and try uh, hypersensitivity dependence and parameters. This is, these are exact formulas. So that's where I see the approach, right? Uh, same cl classical reductions, POD, Galerkin. People are writing papers about POD and Galerkin because they don't universally work. You're projecting down to a subspace, which is not invariant. You're cutting it, it off, pretending that it's invariant. It's not. The solutions from that just projected subspace leave, right? So in some cases, when you're close to the origin, you will be lucky. In other cases, you won't. You never know in advance until you have actually done the work and to refine POD and others, you have to increase the number of modes, the dimension. To refine SSM, you don't. The dimension remains the same. You just increase your order for approximation and get better and better approximation for the invariant manifold. 